So let's start with one of the oldest ones, uh, scalp um, electrodes. So here's an example of a net of electrodes you can put over your head. Uh, this method has been around in various forms for decades. I think they were doing this even in the 50s. Certainly by the 60s, there was lots of this stuff. Um, and the idea is you can have, you know, from, from one, which would be sort of trivial, to hundreds of electrodes just sitting on the edge against your scalp. You don't have to make a hole or anything. Sometimes you'd like scratch a little bit to get a good contact. Uh, or you put some goo in there to make nice contact to the scalp. Um, and so, and from that you just record electrical potentials at each of these positions over the scalp. Okay, and the idea is that neural activity that's going on underneath through the skull, you know, maybe half a centimeter away, um, is producing some net potential from, you know, millions of neurons underneath there um, that you're picking up outside. Okay, so this is very, very crude, this method. Um, but uh, and it has very bad spatial resolution, right? Because electrical potentials, as you guys will know if you've taken 802, will diffuse over the scalp. So even if you had neurons firing all and only right underneath one of those several hundred electrodes, and you had some little tiny local potential, some tiny little bit there, it's going to diffuse a bit and lots of electrodes are going to pick it up and you're going to get a blurry measure of that underlying activity. Okay, so the spatial resolution is pretty crappy. Um, <clears throat> the old analogy uh, is that if you imagine putting a microphone on the outside on top of a football stadium, uh, what could you, and you recorded audio um, during a game, what could you tell? Well, you could probably tell when there was a touchdown. There'd be a lot of noise. And maybe you could tell a few other things, but not a whole lot. Okay, that's the analogy. We're listening from the outside, outside the roof of the stadium, to whatever net kind of gross activity happens. And you know, maybe if you move the microphone around to different parts of the roof, or you had 300 microphones all over the roof, you might get a little bit of information about, you know, which side the, I don't know anything about football, I'm going to stop making this up, which side of the stadium the touchdown happened on or something, right? Um, uh, but beyond that, you wouldn't get very far. Okay. Um, but that's changing. And actually, the whole attitude about this kind of charming, old-fashioned, low-tech method is kind of flipping around and it's suddenly like bell-bottoms occasionally become trendy and hot. I guess not at the moment, but it's happened several times in my lifetime. <laughs> and ERPs are right now, scalp electrodes are now undergoing a little um, kind of trendy phase. Uh, and we'll get later to why that is. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, so let me tell you a little bit more. I've used different words, electroencephalography or EEG. Uh, traditionally, people would use this to just measure waves in different frequency spectra, alpha waves, delta waves, you know, all these oscillations change with your level of awareness, they change in sleep, they change with this and that. That's all very interesting, but less relevant for today. The version of this that's more relevant is what's, what's called event-related potentials. And the idea there is we have the same net of electrodes. I'm the subject, I'm looking at a screen, you flash something up on the screen, and electrical activity does various stuff. For example, we might have a, an electrode here. Here's time. So one of those electrodes is just making a potential measured at the scalp, okay, when we present a stimulus right there, okay? Um, now the key to event-related potentials is since those data are weak and noisy, um, what you do is you repeat that experiment, that little measurement, lots of times, like say 50 times or something, 30, 100, whatever, lots of times and you signal average. So here's the key idea. This is an important idea. So here would be the response of one electrode someplace on the scalp in a subject. Stimulus comes on, say it's a face, for example. And here's what happens at that electrode over time. Maybe this is a second or something. Blue, 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 okay? In, I think, microvolts. Um, so then we just do it again. And here it is again. And you see that looks different from this. And then we do it again, and we see that. And it looks different again. But if you kind of squint, well, maybe there's a family resemblance. So instead of squinting, you signal average. And the crucial idea is that most of that stuff is noise. And by averaging over ma many events, aligning them to the onset of the stimulus, all the stuff that isn't phase locked to the stimulus will average out. And you'll be left only with the systematic electrical changes at that part of your scalp that are systematically, replicably related to processing that stimulus. 
Does everybody get that idea? If not, ask a question. Let me try it again, because it's actually really important. Does that make sense? OK, that's why it's called event-related, is it has a systematic temporal relationship to the onset of the stimulus. Um, so that's called an event-related potential. Um, and so there's a whole field where people have been doing this stuff for, as I said, decades, where for various kinds of visual presentation, um, you can get the systematic set of bumps. So this is a really weird <laughs> and, 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 I don't know, intriguing, but kind of bizarre field where people label these things. These people, there are people who spend their whole lives saying, oh, yeah, the, I study the P1. That's the bump that goes in that direction uh, about 100 milliseconds after you present a visual stimulus. Oh, there's another bump, the N1, that happens there. And there's a P2 and an N2 and a P3. Um, and there are people who spend their whole lives studying these things. And some of them are pretty cool. Like, for example, that P1 pretty clearly responds. It's an early visual cortex response to a visual stimulus. So from dozens, maybe hundreds of studies, it's clear that you present any visual stimulus to a subject, you're going to get a P1 around 80 milliseconds, like less than a tenth of a second after that stimulus flashes on when the visual information is coming up here to visual cortex. OK? So that's kind of cool. Um, this one is more intriguing, the P3. It's sometimes called the oddball response. I'm going to give you all a P3 right now. Beep, 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 boop. You all had a P3 when I said boop. Anything that changes in the stimulus will give you that systematic wave. OK? It's pretty interesting. You can think of lots of ways you could use that to study all kinds of cool stuff. And people have been doing that for 50 years or so. Okay? So anyway, so there's a version of ERPs where people kind of get obsessed with one or the other bump, and you can spend a whole lifetime studying it. And that's you know, one way to spend a lifetime. Uh, <laughs> and some cool stuff has been studied. But there are other more general ways to use it. Okay? So um, let's get back to the question about um, what, can we learn anything about face perception from scalp ERPs? Now, this is one of these cases where there's no obvious answer in advance. It just turns out empirically that if you stick those electrodes on people's heads and show them faces and other things, what you find is there are certain, uh, certain waves, like that P1 and P3, and whatever I just described, P1 and P3, that happen systematically in pretty much every subject at more or less the same latency, the same duration after stimulus onset, and that are selective for faces. Okay? So this is an old study. I, it's a crappy slide, but I like using the actual original slide when it was first discovered. Um, but anyway, you don't care by who. I care by who. Anyway, um, this was discovered in a paper in uh, 1996. Um, and it's hard to see, but here is the recording of one electrode, T5 and T6, are approximately here. T is for temporal. Doesn't, you don't need to know this. I'm just helping you read the slide. They're just positions on the scalp as a totally irrelevant sidebar. I have all, there's a whole system for putting these positions on the scalp that was invented decades ago. You measure around here, and then you take the inter-ear distance, and you bisect it, and you set up a whole coordinate system on the scalp so you have a way to specify where is that electrode on another person's scalp? And uh, I have the whole, uh, it's called the 1020 system. I have the whole 1020 system tattooed on my scalp, color coded. I'll show you later if you're interested. Anyway, uh, it's for a failed experiment, but uh, anyway, they're still there 20 years after the experiment failed. Anyway, so T5, which we could find on me if I could remember what color it was, which I don't, is somewhere around here. Um, and T6 is on the other side over the temporal lobe. That's what the T is. And so this is another one of those bumps, like that P1, P3 that I described, um, called the N170, because it's negative going um, and because it happens at 170 milliseconds after stimulus onset. And what you see, if you look at it, uh, is that bump um, is deeper for faces than it is for scrambled faces, cars, or scrambled cars. Scrambled meaning you chop it up and move the bits around. Um, and that's even bigger over the right hemisphere than the left. Okay? So that's a, you know, you're just measuring scalp electrodes, and it just so, it didn't have to be, but it just so happens that 170 milliseconds after you present a face, not after you present a car or a scrambled face, or it turns out pretty much anything else, um, you get this particular electrical response. Okay? Everybody got that? So um, that's cool. Um, and what does it tell us? Well, 
gives us a little bit of a hint that there may be some different brain mechanisms involved in face perce perception compared to object perception. Okay, everybody get how you can sort of infer that? It's very indirect. We have very little spatial information. It's just somewhere over here at around 170 milliseconds. Something happens in the brain to faces, not to objects. That's basically what you can infer. So that um, still pretty low tech uh, finding already tells us there's something a little bit different going on with face perception and object perception. But it also tells us another new thing that the other ones didn't. And that is it tells us when we have that information. Right? It tells us that by 170 milliseconds, your brain has distinguished a face from a non-face. Okay? That's important. Because if we want to understand that whole sequence of processing steps, those processing steps unfold over time. Okay? And if we want to try to someday write the code that the brain is implementing when it recognizes faces, we need to know what that sequence of processing steps is. And this is our first clue that one of them discriminates faces versus objects. And in humans, that happens at 170 milliseconds. OK? Everybody got that? OK. Um, so that is the old-fashioned uh, version, uh, scalp event-related potentials.